So um, first of all, let me draw your attention to uh, two groups of menstruating women who were uh, imprisoned in the 20th century Europe. The first group is Jewish women who were imprisoned in the Nazi Germany during Holocaust uh, in the concentration camps as a torture method. Rags or clothes were not provided. And the women and girls were subjected to inhuman condition. Uh, one of the Holocaust survivors later remarked, I quote her, we had no water to wash ourselves. We had no underwear. We could go nowhere. Everything was sticking to us. And for me, that was the most dehumanizing thing of everything, unquote. So there was a conspicuous dearth of rags and uh, the blood visibly stained their bodies and clothes. So in those days, menstrual shame and repulsion and disgust towards menstruation were more severe than today. So this disgust and uh, entailing shame and uh, humiliation alienated these women who were already marginalized in the camp. And many women stopped menstruating altogether because uh, that's what uh, happens when you are um, you are starved, when you are malnourished, tortured, or when you are forced to work like slaves and uh, living under the imminent threat of death. So the second um, group was around 30 women of Northern Ireland who are imprisoned for their fight for independence from Great Britain. When they suffered egregious treatment in the jail, they organized in 1918 to smear their menstrual blood on the prison walls. So the dramatic demonstration not only caught the attention of the prison guards, this dirty protest, as it came to be uh, later called, this protest later empowered a full-blown Republican feminism by educating a wide variety of women's rights beyond the uh, full independence from Britain. So for example, it resulted uh, in a landmark policy document you know, arguing for increased access to divorce, uh, increased access to public child care, free and accessible contraception, and um, sex education. So the first incident in Nazi Germany uh, shows how menstruation can be uh, used to torture or to victimize or to dehumanize menstruators. The second incident um, shows what happens when activism, uh, when activists weaponize menstrual blood itself. So this protest took its force simply by violating standard menstrual taboos or by rendering uh, the public what normally uh, you know, remains private. So I'll be talking about menstrual activism, uh, a critique of dominant narratives, uh, in the first section, I'll be talking about uh, the, these dominant narratives, and uh, after that, I'll I'll focus on menstrual activism and how menstrual activism has been uh, challenging these dominant uh, narratives. So, after analyzing various uh, historical and contemporary structures, I found that there are a lot of dominant narratives. So, it has been found that uh, culture religion, medical science, and industry are the four major structures uh, which propagate the hegemonic uh, homogeneous menstrual narratives uh, due to which millions of menstruators face severe discrimination. So uh, when we look at the uh, cultural narratives, depending on their geographic, uh, ethnic, demographic, again, uh, religious, political, uh, economic factors, different cultural groups perceive and experience menstruation in enormously different ways. In many communities, menstrual blood is considered both sacred and profane. And on the one hand, it is regarded as uh, magical, powerful, productive, and uh, divine, and often associated with uh, symbols like uh, moon, flower, river, seasons, and nature. On the other hand, uh, it is considered as pollutant, unclean, and connected images with like uh, snake, devil, and monsters. 
and menstruators are often uh, worshipped as uh, powerful goddesses and uh, confined as uh, you know dangerous witches. But even though there are uh, considerable positive aspects related to menstruation, these positive associations do not supersede, do not overrule the potentially uh, dangerous interpretations of this process. In the, uh, in the second set, Simon de Beauvoir postulated that the inherent patriarchal structure of the society is a reason behind the negative attitude towards menstruation. Uh, she connected it with her central concept of uh, you know, women as the other, and she argues that the association of menstruation with negative uh, meanings is primarily because, I quote her, Menstrual blend embodies the essence of femininity and because it emanates from genital organs, unquote. So the cultures uh, which denigrate menstruation impose several uh, menstrual taboos uh, upon women. According to scholars like Mary Douglas, uh, one of the most important speculation behind menstrual taboo is a, a purity pollution belief. A female body with its fluid nature and uh, multiple vaginal discharges is found more susceptible to society's purification rituals and uh, practices. For example, when we look at the Indian uh, cultural uh, discourses, Indian civilization uh, cultural discourses are embedded in the concept of shaucha and ashauja. And menstruation is regarded as the utmost manifestation of ashauja. This one of the most widely propagated dominant menstrual narrative is that menstruation is a kind of impurity. In addition to uh, this purity pollution belief, purity pollution uh, dichotomy, many scholars found that the sense of danger is one of the major reasons behind the origin of menstrual taboos. So this was also pointed out by uh, the French feminist and uh, psychoanalyst Julia Kristeva in her book, the powers of powers of horror and essay on objection. She connected menstrual blood with uh, abject and argued that, I quote, menstrual blood stands for the danger issuing from within the identity and it threatens a relationship between the sexes within a social aggregate, unquote. So many societies believe that a menstruating woman emits mana or threatening supernatural power which can destroy each and every object around her. For example, Roman natural philosopher Pliny the Elder in his book uh, 7 and uh, book 28 of natural history asserted that menstrual blood is, if menstrual blood is exposed to uh, flashes of lightning, it can drive away even you know, uh, hailstorms and whirlwinds. A menstruating woman's touch can abort the pregnant mares and banish the bees from their hives. A dog that tastes it becomes mad. So he also argued that uh, contact with menstrual blood can turn white or sterile crops, kill grafts, dry up seeds, and make fruits from fall from trees. So that's in many cultures, a girl is considered dangerous to the society after her monarchy. And uh, as Simon de Beauvoir noted in the second six, I quote her, I quote unquote, she inspires horror in man. So this another dominant uh, narrative propagated by culture is that uh, menstruation is something dangerous. So along with culture, religion also plays an influential role in determining uh, our perspectives on menstruation. Even though there are some exceptions like Sikhism, and uh, even though there are uh, several positive religious menstrual traditions, um, you know, rituals and practices, the majority of religions, including um, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism, and their uh, texts and traditions all perceive menstruation as a uh, as a sign of moral as well as ritual uh, as well as physical impurity. So, uh, in, in Christianity, it is a curse for Eve's original sin. In Hinduism, in Rig Veda, women had taken upon uh, themselves the guilt and sin of Indra slaying of Vishwaroba. And the sin reappears every month in the form of menstruation. In Quran, menstruation is unclean and it is a kind of illness. So Monica Jew and Barbara Moore wrote in their book, uh, The Great 
cosmic mother accords them if life is inherently evil the church fathers needed someone to blame and who is better to blame than woman who creates life from her own body unquote so in addition religions exert several religiously motivated menstrual practices upon women such as restrictions to enter sacred religious places and to perform religious uh, practices such as uh, you know religious duties such as puja homam or namaz so uh, you know we have to remind the fact that uh, most of these taboos are originated from the superstitions and um, ignorance of ancient times and human beings of the period had with their you know traditional uh, knowledge system had their own reasons to practice and observe them blindly but even after a majority of population is educated the negative hold of cultures and religions on menstruation and menstruating body is still persisting so uh, this menstrual uh, menstruation is a religious uh, phenomenon today uh, just as much as a cultural or physiological one so in addition to culture and religion despite their uh, meritorious contributions medical science and menstrual product industry to uh, have interpreted uh, menstruation dangerously and they created modern menstrual myths and modern menstrual uh, taboos and narratives so scientific disciplines have defined it as a pathological condition or uh, a psychological syndrome or an obsolete process that should be suppressed or eliminated for example in the 20th century the more traumatic events like world war holocaust uh, atomic bombings and the uh, great depression and the sinking of titanic and vietnam war etc etc which uh, definitely created uh, you know psychological and emotional damage in the early 20th century you know western consciousness so at this juncture medical science used psychoanalysis particularly freudian psychoanalysis to define and explain menstruation menstruation became a neurosis and karen horney in her 1967 book titled feminine psychology introduced the term premenstrual tension for the first time so similarly uh, you know like medical science uh, menstrual product industry you know profit driven uh, you know industries propagated the culture of concealment the culture of secrecy a 1949 advertisement of a sanitary napkin it announced that you don't know you are wearing one and neither does anyone else so with the help of advertisements industry interpreted menstruation as a as a secret and a, a hygienic crisis and it uh, homogenized menstruation with the notion of a healthier and happier uh, bleeding so as forms of objective knowledge culture religion medical science uh, industry capitalism and other discourses on uh, menstruation regulate menstruating bodies by uh, structuring the social and individual behaviors their attitudes and thoughts and they create various cultural norms to be observed or practiced not only by the menstruators but also by the rest of society for example menstruators are, are um, they are asked to observe certain menstrual taboos uh, they are asked to conceal menstruation or to be silent about menstruation or to suppress or eliminate the entire process itself so in addition the rest of the society particularly mothers teachers doctors health education trainers they are all trained to monitor menstruating bodies in the form of an optic and surveillance so, but the most alarming thing is that menstruators internalize these cultural norms uh, over the course of time and they regulate themselves by self surveillance and by observing um, certain self disciplinary uh, practices so for example girls use code language to talk about menstruation they use euphemisms to talk about menstruation they they try to hide menstrual products from uh, others and they choose uh, dark colored clothes on those uh, days so due to this uh, you know unfavorable dominant narratives propagated by uh, these structures 
millions of menstruators they face severe discrimination they face severe injustice and human rights violations so these dominant narratives were challenged gradually in america by a mid to late 20th century movement which is now called menstrual activism a notable uh, critical menstrual studies scholar brenda fast defines uh, menstrual activism in her book out for blood essays on menstruation that it is a kind of a social activism that works to upset challenge and reverse the impulses to silence and shame menstruating women unquote on the other hand according to british journalist and novelist kida cochrane the term menstrual activism is used to describe a quote a whole range of actions not all considered political by the person involved simple efforts to speak openly about periods radical efforts to negative attitudes and campaigns for more environment friendly sanitary products unquote so even though menstrual activism has a turbulent uh, revolutionary history of around 50 years uh, this has been neglected and omitted from the academic discussions from the public discussions due to the stigma um, towards menstruation so it was in uh, 1970 menstrual activism began to emerge uh, gradually so uh, it was in the 1970s menstrual activism began to emerge gradually as a as a loosely organized social uh, socio political movement uh, out of the convergence of three interrelated movements women's health movement uh, consumer activism and environmentalism it happened when particularly two crises struck women across america a health crisis out of uh, toxic shock syndrome it was caused by a protector and gamble product called relay and it was introduced into the market with the slogan it's even absorbs worry so in the second uh, second incident is is an environmental crisis due to dioxin pollution a chemical used in the making of menstrual uh, products so during these two crises women's health activists feminist wing of consumer activism and uh, environmentalism began to address menstruation and uh, uh, you know fought against menstrual products uh, menstrual product industries lack of commitment to menstruators and their safety So in addition the foundation for menstrual activism were also laid and strengthened by the feminist theoretical engagements like uh, from feminists like uh, Simone de Beauvoir Julia Kristeva Emily Martin uh, Gloria Steinem Elizabeth Kistling and Jean Jacobs Bemberg and of course Sophie Lowe Iris Marian Jung and Karen Hopwood so menstrual activism addresses a wide range of social and uh, political issues menstrual uh, activists devote themselves to subvert the dominant narratives of menstruation they try to eradicate the disgust towards menstruation and they question the idea of menstrual shame and the imposition of menstrual taboos upon uh, female bodies the early menstrual activists of the 1970s and 1980s like uh, barbara hanelow John Morris, Mary Jo Gimbetus and uh, Tamara Slayton uh, these people they celebrated menstruation and they reclaimed menstruation as a uh, healthy spiritual empowering and you know even pleasurable experience and considered menstruation as a as an essential female female experience and and uh, you know, they created a sisterhood among menstruators so they created women only spaces like red tent to gather during menstruation so unlike these early menstrual activists later menstrual activists like mary abendanza and um, yona etchella uh they came uh, in uh, after 1990 and they rejected the romanticization and celebration of menstruation and they considered uh, menstruation just a biological 
process. They found that the essentialization of menstruation is problematic in the case of sexuality because there are hundreds of people who do menstruate but do not identify themselves as women, such as trans males, transsexuals, and intersex. And there are a lot of people like trans women who, who want to identify themselves as women, but who cannot menstruate. So they, this, uh, these menstrual activists, they try to cure menstruation by uncoupling menstruation from the gendered body. And they contributed the term menstruators to refer all individuals who menstruate. Menstrual activism, uh, menstrual activism is anti-corporate in, uh, in nature, and it critiques the commodification of menstruating bodies by uh, menstrual product industry, pharmaceutical companies, and advertisements. And there are three works which stand as a backbone of menstrual activism's critique of corporate colonization of uh, you know, menstruating bodies. The first one is Elizabeth Kisling's Capitalizing on the Curse, The Business of Menstruation. Second one is Karen Hopal's The Curse, Last Unmentionable Taboo, Menstruation, and Jean Jacobs Grumberg, The Body Project. So taking inspiration from these works, menstrual activism, menstrual activists tried to criticize industry. So even though uh, menstrual activists agree with the fact that Commercialization has made uh, easily available, affordable, and user-friendly menstrual products for women. They also declare that these changes brought by commercialization have unfavorable repercussion on menstruation. The primary message of industry or advertisement to the society, particularly to menstruators, um, is shame and secrecy. They made menstruation a cleanliness issue, what Brumberg calls a hygienic crisis rather than a maturation event. Again, influenced by Foucault's uh, critique of medical science, Emily Martin's unveiling of medical science and industrialization in, the, in her book, The Woman in the Body, and Louis Lander's book, Images of Bleeding, Menstruation as Ideology, Menstrual activists point out the hidden dangers in the over medicalization of menstrual cycle, uh, premenstrual syndrome, and menopause. And they share the bioethical concerns related to uh, menstrual suppression. Thus, they problematize the uh, prominent, uh, the dominant, uh, you know, scientific and medical interpretations uh, that menstruation is nothing but a disease or pathological condition. And menstrual activist also unveils the unenthusiastic negative portrayals uh, of menstruation and menstruating bodies in literature, film, television, music, popular culture. And in addition, they also uh, address men, men's attitude towards menstruation and menstrual products. This menstrual activism uncovers you know, multiple complex issues related to contemporary menstrual culture. This, uh, you know, uh, they brought out a series of political actions that go beyond the hegemonic view of menstruation and they raise a kind of critical menstrual consciousness in society. So menstrual activism, which originated in America in, in the uh, 1970s, in the early 1970s, spread to different parts of the world uh, in the uh, following decades. In India, menstrual activism is a, is a very recent phenomenon. Uh, in India, before developing into an organized activism in the second decade of the 21st century, its traces, it, its traces can be um, seen in a couple of personal encounters with contemporary menstrual culture. For example, Arunajala Muruganandam uh, invented the low-cost sanitary pad making machine and fights against uh, period poverty. And there are people like uh, Aditi Gupta who uh, you know, founded Menstropedia comic and to educate uh, in menstruators. Uh, people like Muruganandam and Swadi Badekar and uh, Ami Meta, they successfully resist the you know, neo-colonial motives of Western menstrual product industry when it exploits the common people of uh, developing countries by 
big, harmful products in the markets of the, uh, you know, developing countries like India. So these activists, they resist the neo-colonial motives by uh, creating low-cost, user-friendly, environment-friendly and affordable alternative products. From uh, these individual endeavors, um, menstrual activism developed into organized corporate uh, later. In December 2014, when around 40 women under the age of 50 uh, were forced to undergo a strip search by uh, two women supervisors after a used sanitary found in their, uh, you know, in the factory's latrine. So, so the strip search is for the menstruators violation of menstrual norms. The societal discourses, they certainly train menstruators to show uh, appropriate gender specific forms of behavior. And when menstruators deviate from these behaviors, they are punished to bring about conformity. And this is what happened in the, you know, in the factory. So one has to remember the fact that it, it occurred in a state with the highest literacy rate in the country. So against this, the Red Alert campaign was launched and the group asked, to, asked the public to, uh, to send used or unused sanitary napkins to the, to the manager of the factory. The factory was, uh, you know, shut down early. So this is one of the earliest incidents in which menstrual blood and sanitary napkins were used as modes of resistance in the country. But it is also one of the earliest attempts by talking publicly about menstruation and by making menstruation visible. So as Suja Bharati has argued in her forward to her uh, book, Artavatinda Pashti, Politics of Menstruation, uh, these protesters were initiating the subsequent menstrual discussions and protests in Kerala. And this, they were marking the dawn of menstrual activism in the country. So the factory incident reveals an additional, uh, you know, serious issue: the lack of facilities to manage menstrual waste in the country. So for, for working women, for traveling women, for students, changing pad is a Himalayan task, and, uh, and and you might have gone through it. It is unimaginably horrible. So uh, even the most developed cities of India has have been designed and developed in such a way that the women cannot travel even in the absence of menstruation. And most of working spaces or institutions are male dominated and they are not uh, they are not at all you know, female friendly and there is a lack of proper toilet facilities for many working women in their institution. And it is a serious concern. So this is the main reason for increasing menstrual anxiety among working women. But at the same time, we have to remind one more thing. There is a class of women who are, uh, who are unfortunate enough to benefit from these facilities. In many elite institutions, we, women are provided with restrooms uh, attached with uh, you know, toilets, uh, having light, water, tissues, and even mirrors. So it shows that there is a menstrual divide like Rekha Raj and uh, Jay Deviga, they expose this class or class-based disparity in menstrual experience of women. So Rekha Raj uh, describes in her in her article, Artha Mam Samsar which appeared in 2015 in Mount Bumi Weekly with a cover story. Um, so in that uh, article, Rekha Raj argues that, Rekha Raj um, says that in her nearby villages, which was populated by upper caste uh, women, upper caste people, the women of uh, upper caste houses had the opportunity to take rest, relax, and um, spend their time in separate rooms during menstruation. On the other hand, in her locality, most of the houses were of lower class and or, or lower caste and these women had no chance to uh, you know to take rest or relax during time because even in in those menstruating days they had to work hard in the fields 
maybe half immersed in water. So even after decades, this is not different for women who work in factories, who work, uh, you know, in fields, who sell fish. So uh, the the experience of menstruation, the concept of rest or the separation from uh, households, different orientation and dimension for different classes. Rika Raj also, uh, you know, uh, describes a very appealing aspect of caste-based menstrual experience in the same article. Uh, during Shabarimala Mandala Puja season, if a male member of the uh, upper caste family observes uh, 41 days of rhythm, menstruating women of that family often went to sleep in the nearby lower caste houses since their presence would be a hindrance for their rhythm. This shows the intensity of the concept like menstrual pollution and impurity. And at the same time, it also shows the intensity of uh, you know, caste-based pollution. So menstrual taboos is implemented, uh, menstrual taboos are implemented not just as a method to maintain hygiene. In India, menstrual taboo is closely associated with the you know, a purity pollution belief, which in turn, an invention of Brahminism. So in an upper caste family, a woman is considered as ritually impure during menstruation. However, she regains her purity after menstruation. But according to Brahminical beliefs, lower caste people are ritually impure by birth. So since lower caste were not allowed to enter houses of upper caste. The administration is also not a threat to upper caste uh, family of upper caste people, but their labor is needed and allowed in their fields and yards. So the reason a uh, menstrual divide, a uh, caste-based, class-based menstrual divide in, in, in India. So when we look at the strategies of menstrual activism and methods of uh, menstrual activism, they often conduct organized social protest on streets and campuses, um, universities and educational institutions. For example, in, in 2001, a Montreal-based activist group um, known as the Black Sisters, they conducted a parade as part of a Michigan Women's Festival and it is known as the parade is known as the Red Brigade March. They were dedicated to uh, expose the risk associated with conventional uh, feminine protection. And their slogans uh, include Tampax Evil, Join the Red Revolution, and The Personal is Political. And the most famous critical menstrual studies scholar, Chris Bobel, was present there. And this parade and these slogans motivated Chris Bobel to write the book titled A New Blood, Third Wave Feminism and the Politics of Menstruation, which helped to inaugurate critical menstrual studies across the world. So similarly, in 2015, taking inspiration from a 19-year-old German girl, Ellen Kastrigia, the undergraduate students of Jamia Malia University and uh, later JNU, um, Delhi University and, uh, and Jadavpur University students, they, they began a similar campaign by uh, sticking used napkins, uh, you know, sticking unused napkins uh, across the campus on with messages on them against gender violence and menstrual uh, stigma, menstrual taboos. And when we look at the mode of operation, a street protest and protest in campuses and colleges and educational institutions are important uh, you know, ways of resistance. Menstrual activists also use media campaigns and particularly um, social media campaigns like Happy to Bleed movement initiated by uh, Nikita Azad. And again, conferences, workshops, uh, and programs like Arpo Artavam and consciousness uh, raising educational campaigns are also a method of menstrual activism. And this seminar is also uh, comes as part of menstrual activism. So uh, similarly, menstrual activists also attempt to challenge contemporary menstrual culture through legal intervention. And the best, the very best example for this, uh, we can see in the Shabarimala issue. 
a Supreme Court verdict on Shabrimala issue became a landmark in the uh, history of India's menstrual activism. What is Shabrimala's contribution to menstrual activism in the country? Uh, to an extent, Shabrimala issue led to the normalization of menstruation in a society by encouraging people to uh, discuss unashamedly about it. Menstruation became a serious subject matter, not only for newspapers, uh, news channels, magazines, but for common people who began to, but for also for common people who, uh, who began to address, uh, who began to discuss menstruation in public places. So, uh, and menstrual activists, they also carry out their protest through uh, individual methods of resistance, such as art. The earliest manifestations of menstrual activism can be found in the artworks of Judy Chicago, an American uh, you know, feminist art pioneer. And it came as part of feminist body art movement of the 1970s. In, in 1971, uh, Chicago came out with the photo lithograph named Red Flag, a close-up shot of Chicago uh, from the waist down, pulling out a bloody tangle from her vagina. Again, Red Flag radically articulated the resistance to the culture of uh, menstrual shame and concealment and takes a female bodily process, the female body process, out of obscurity. Again, she came out another artwork in 1972. Uh, Chicago installed uh, menstruation bathroom this is the work, uh, menstruation bathroom. Uh, it was installed in Woman House, uh, an, an art space called, an exhibition space called Woman House. And it features a sportless white bathroom, liberally scattered with countless used and yet to be used menstrual products. So this work shows how menstruation, uh, menstruating body is ruled or uh, controlled by industry. And many people were uncomfortable with this and they, they saw this as disgusting and repulsive. And again, the shock value created by Judy Chicago's work was, were, was immense. And Chicago was uh, later followed by artists like, you know, Christine Garvin, uh, Gray, uh, J. Chris Lee and um, Jen Lewis. And British uh, artist Ingrid Burton Moyne, she developed her menstrual art from a challenge posed by feminist um, theoretician, feminist German Greer in 1970. In her work, The Female Eunuch, Greer challenged women to taste their menstrual blood, saying, if you think you are emancipated, if you think, I quote her, if you, uh, if you think you are emancipated, you might consider the idea of tasting your menstrual blood. If it makes you sick, you have got a long way to go, unquote. So in 2019, Venice Benale, uh, she exhibited a series of 12 photographs. Ingrid Burton Moyne exhibited a series of uh, 12 photographs entitled Red is Color. And that featured women wearing menstrual blood on their lips as a sort of menstrual lipstick. Again, we have uh, Indian artists like uh, Lila uh, Freechild and Sarah Nakwi and Ruby Kaur, who posted her uh, period photograph in Instagram and Instagram removed it twice from, uh, from it. So uh, menstrual product art have greater dimension when they use menstrual blood and the instruments of standard menstrual products in unconventional ways. Chris Bobel pointed out that menstrual art, I quote her, announces with a wing that we are not ashamed of our cycles. We are not afraid to handle in public the products that we use to manage our flow, unquote. In the case of menstrual art, the border between uh, you know, the art and activism becomes blurry. And menstrual artists use menstrual blood as a tool to challenge the uh, existing notions of the object. And they try to confront sexism propagated by uh, dominant uh, discourses and narratives. 
So uh, literature is also contributing to menstrual activism tremendously. Conventionally, discussions of menstrual menstruation are uh, rare in, uh, in literature and um, most often generally uh, present in males' point of view. Um, confrontation with a white uh, way, um, Moby Dick, though unlikely, it is at least possible in literature. But uh, in literature, uh, having a first period is not possible. Having your period is not possible. If menstruation is ever, ever depicted or represented, it is often depicted negatively in literature. For example, William Faulkner, uh, in his uh, The Sound and Fury, defines uh, women, as they quote him, delicate equilibrium of periodical filth between two moons balanced, unquote. Kitty, in Christopher Morley's Kitty Foil, she came across uh, her monarchy during a train journey. And she thinks that, I quote, of course, it proved to be the curse for the time, unquote. In Stephen King's horror novel, Carrie, the central character, um, Carrie, transforms into a monster after her monarchy. But parallel to the emergence and evolution of menstrual activism, several literary works began to address menstruation you know, seriously. Uh, Judy Bloom's in adult novel, Are You the God? It's Me, Margaret. Again, Anita Diamond's novel, The Red Tent, and Anne Patch's novel, State of Wonder. And in Indian literature, we have Tungal Khanna's um, actress uh, and writer, Tungal Khanna's short story, The Sanitary Man from a Sacred Land. Uh, it is inspired by the life of uh, menstrual activist Arunajala Muruganandam, and it addresses India's spirit poverty. And Shahina Kerefik's uh, short story, Ladies Kulpe, Adavati Indari Mandi. Vinoy Thomas' short story, Mulla Ranyana. And uh, Shemi's autobiographical novel, Nadavari Ile Nerigal, are, are some of the you know, examples for, for the changes happening in literature. Let me take one incident from Judy Bloom's novel. In, in the novel, uh, the central character, vehemently critique the nature and ideology of menstruation education, uh, which was provided at schools in contemporary America. In, uh, in 1964, in association with Kimberly Clark, Walt Disney produced, uh, it released a film, a, short, a documentary film titled The Story of Menstruation. And it has been reported that by 1984, the film has been shown to more than 100 million students and they, all, uh, they also distributed um, uh, a pamphlet, uh, two copies of, I mean, two pamphlets for the students. And in the novel, as part of health education, a movie named What Every Girl Should Know was, uh, was exhibited, which, which was sponsored by the company named Private Lady Sanctuary Supplies. It was screened in the central character, Margaret School Auditorium. And Margaret notices the commercial interest behind the screening of the film. She says, I quote her, the booklet provided by the organizers of the film recommended that we use private lady sanitary supplies. It was like one big commercial, unquote. So by incorporating a parody of menstrual education in the film, Bloom's strongly deride and ridicule them. So uh, I take another example from, uh, you know, um, a 2015 autobiographical novel, Nadavari uh, Ilan it was written by, you know, Shemi. And the central character who spent her girlhood in an orphanage recollects her painful efforts to manage menstruation. Since there is no water in the pipe for three days, uh, her menstrual cloth was dipping in blood and she sneaked into each room to steal the water stored in those rooms uh, to wash the menstrual clothes to reuse them. So she was caught and um, she was labeled as water stealer. And uh, this novel, uh, this incident in the novel shows how debilitating menstruation is for homeless, for orphans or for, refuge, for, for refugees uh, particularly when there is severe period poverty. 
Films and documentaries are also an integral part of menstrual activism. Even though there are some movies like, you know, uh, Pavitram, uh, Parinayam, Buddha Kannadi, uh, Ina, Niral uh, and Neena, uh, which uh, briefly mention menstruation, uh, a dramatic change in perspective is visible in movies which came recently. Some recent movies which appeared simultaneous to India's menstrual movement, such as Padman, Fullu, Pirit, End of Sentence, Peranba, Venal, and The Great Indian Kitchen, all these movies address menstruation seriously. For example, let me take an incident from The Great Indian Kitchen. When the husband, um, uh, the character was portrayed by Suraj, the husband who has taken the rhythm to go Shabramala, he, he falls off from scooter and uh, she she rushes to rescue the the wife um, you know the, the character played by nimisha sajayan she rushes to rescue him and touches him unknowingly in fear so it becomes a serious issue in the family that holds rigid beliefs regarding menstruation so including the belief that a menstruating woman's touch will pollute others particularly men so the movie, you know, uh, again address another serious concern. Uh, Usha, the servant, she says to the central character, uh, I, I'll, she says to the uh, central character, Pandate oru reedigal noki jeevikan noki namuk jeevikan bato. Inja amme ne unnu inja agat teka ketto lairnu. Parambani ka nartha. Nyan oru kajim parayte. Periods are yellow, yan particular panicapo. Masa, mona la dersam, panicapo and dinna, are the nan tarana. Any can day, could tell a panic and day. Pinne, any king any okay undo in the Arich Indicana. Upon Idina Marubedi Aita, Nimisha Barayanda, Chechi, Oli and a low in the letter. But uh, Usha's statement, it shows a serious uh, concern, it, sh it shows that menstrual leave. Menstrual leave will be debilitating for several women from poor socioeconomic background. So, in the Tamil movie, again in the Tamil movie, Peranba, a 14 year old girl, uh, um, you know, um, named Papa, she was suffering from, she's suffering from cerebral palsy and she struggles with menstruation. The film also shows menstruation is a um, serious, uh, it, it is a, a key site for discrimination and violence against women and girls uh, with disabilities. Again, humor is also used as a kind of weapon. Men and uh, sometimes women too derogate menstruation and menstruating, uh, menstruating women using menstrual jokes and humor. For example, commenting on a tough question asked by journalist uh, Megan Kelly, Former American president and uh, the then Republican presidential candidate, Donald Trump said, I quote, Megyn Kelly starts asking me all sorts of ridiculous questions. You could see there was blood coming out of her eyes, blood coming out of her wherever, unquote. So Trump uses menstrual reference to attack Kelly. You know, menstrual activists, they use uh, humor as a strategy to counter or retort this tradition. And they employ humor not only to arouse the interest of their audience, but also to criticize contemporary perspectives on menstruation. And, the, uh, and the, uh, one of the most important examples is Gloria Steinem's uh, article, If Men Could Menstruate. So, you know, menstrual activists, including artists, politicians, uh, writers, poets, film directors, graphic designers, and bloggers, they employ a variety of genres such as fiction, uh, memoirs, autobiographies, manifestos, empirical researches, educational comic books, uh, coloring books, paintings, photographs, uh, graphic designs, films, documentaries, menstruation-themed websites, podcasts, Know, blogs, trolls, memes, and smartphone apps to challenge the uh, dangerous aspects of uh, existing menstrual culture. So, however, uh, there is a fundamental limitation to, you know, menstrual activism. 
In the West, it is dominated by white middle class heterosexual women. Even though uh, West has a racially and ethnically diverse population, the participation of uh, women of color is almost absent in menstrual activism. In addition, there are you know, hidden dangers in the cultural appropriation of uh, you know, red tent uh, into modern uh, spaces. So uh, one of the major shortcomings of menstrual activism in India is that it is dominated by upper class, upper caste, heterosexual women. And its activities are restricted to India's most educated uh, states like Kerala, West Bengal, and regions like you know, uh, Delhi and institutions like colleges and universities. So the activities of the movement and its benefits do not reach to the lowest strata of society. And Indian menstrual activism must prioritize marginalized population and menstruators who are ignored, such as those who are jailed, refugees, disabled, uh, trans or non-binary, um, homeless and low income uh, uh, people. So, and uh, Indian menstrual activism must also try to link um, with, um, with uh, their progressive social movements and uh, other progressive social movements and you know, groups which focus uh, social class struggle, anti-caste, environmental sustainability, uh, homeless, LGBT just, uh, LGBT just and uh, you know, sexual violence prevention, universal education, etc., etc. So fostering individual as well as collective resistance, menstrual activism opposes the dominant menstrual culture and normative societal ideologies, which harmfully affect menstruating bodies. It dismantles the existing unfavorable interpretations of menstruation. And menstrual activists argue that menstruators are no longer earthbound by their blood and body. Raising a politics of menstruation is a milestone in the struggle for the liberation of menstruators. Menstrual activism uh, has been successfully raising a politics of menstruation across the globe. And uh, by demonstrating a surge of you know, uh, political actions by various individuals, communities, organizations, and uh, menstrual activism is growing rapidly. So decades of menstrual activism have moved uh, menstrual blood from the uh, menstrual blood and menstruators from the margin to the center, from the private to the uh, public, and from the personal to the political. Thank you.